don't think about the end of a lease at the end of a lease. It is a working document, it's a living document and you need to constantly keep it under review, you need to factor it into your business planning and so your lease needs to work for you. What we'll be discussing is what things to be aware of at the end of the lease, but more importantly, what things should be discussed at the outset. So what would we expect a tenant to negotiate at the start of a lease and what things just to be aware of so that you don't get caught out at the end of your lease. Seeing whether the lease is contracted out of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. If it is, then the tenant has no protection at the end of that lease term. If it's within the Landlord and Tenant Act, then there are statutory provisions which would allow the tenant to continue remaining within the property, provided certain conditions are met, negotiate this at the heads of term stage, decide whether you want to be there just for the 20 year term for example or do you want to have the ability to remain at that property usually when a tenant has occupied a property for say 20 years they've established their goodwill there they've created connections they don't want to be seen to be moving to another property so it would be ideal for them to have the landlord and tenant act granted within the lease rather than contracting them out of the lease itself there was a recent case the canary wharf case where the tenant had to be based in europe it was part of their regulatory requirements. With the UK leaving the EU they can no longer comply with that and so now they're looking at moving elsewhere. This is all based around Brexit where the European Medicines Agency has said that as a result of Brexit they can no longer have their headquarters in London and have to go back to Amsterdam. The courts have rejected this argument on the basis that actually in fact the tenant has the ability to assign the lease to a third party. The lease has not been frustrated however the tenant has been given leave to appeal so it's a matter of watch this space and let's see how the Court of Appeal deals with this going forward. And finally, just very quickly, forfeiture is another way that a lease can come to an end. If a tenant has breached its terms under the lease, then the landlord can exercise its rights to forfeit the lease and regain possession. We've come to the end of the lease. First thing to do is look at the repair obligations. Are you under an obligation to keep the property in good repair and condition throughout? Has the repair obligation been limited to a schedule of condition? If there's no schedule of condition, it's really uncertain for the tenant as to what condition they've got to give the property back to the landlord. So I would always re recommend to my tenants that let's get a schedule of condition attached to the lease so it can be really clear to all parties what their obligations are throughout the term of the lease and in what condition the property should be kept in at the end of the lease as well. When you're looking at entering into a new lease be really careful about the heads of terms that you agree. Instruct a solicitor who knows what kind of things to look out for. Keep in the flexibility so that you're not struggling when you're trying to get out of a lease. Just some practical points. If the tenant's lease is granted for seven years or more, then it would have been registered with the land registry and have its own title number. A tenant solicitor would always deal with the formalities of removing the title register and closing down that title from the land registry's records. And if it's a lease that's less than seven years, then a notice can be entered into the freehold title register, which is the landlord's title, and a well-drafted lease would make it really clear and leave no ambiguity at all break notices tends to be the biggest pitfall for most clients and it's quite a heavily contested area in property litigation so I thought that it was an appropriate focus for today. Due to the change in High Street and potentially now Brexit, generally we're finding our lease renewals are being negotiated for much shorter terms. You have to be able to adapt and one way that you can do this is either to agree a shorter term lease or you agree a long lease with a break clause, so a 10 year lease with a 5 year break read the terms of the lease very, very carefully. Even if it seems pointless, if the lease says it, do it. And when you factor in the notice period in, you need to look at, are there any deemed service provisions in the lease? Does the lease say you have to serve on their solicitors? Are there different service addresses in the lease that aren't that property address? Don't take for granted that the parties are still exactly the same as when the lease was negotiated 10 years ago the landlord could have sold the property. There are two types of break notice. You've got a once and for all break notice and a rolling break. However, what's more common generally is you've got one chance. If you miss that chance because you don't serve the notice correctly, the notice doesn't comply, then that's it. You are tied into the lease for the remainder of the term. 
and you're then looking at negotiating a surrender with the landlord or you have to remain in the premises. Even if you have validly served the notice, if you do not comply with the conditions, you will be held to not have exercised the break and so you will miss your chance to break. Vacant possession, free of any third party occupation, so any licences, any tenancies. If you've granted any subtenancies, they have to be terminated before the break date. Tenants, fixtures and fittings. The obvious things are things like tables, chairs, desks. It gets more complicated when you start looking at things that are attached to the building. If you can remove it and it's still usable in its condition, chances are it might well be a tenant's fixture if it was installed by the tenant. If in doubt, speak to the landlord in advance and agree what's staying, what's going. We act for landlords and tenants and obviously landlords and tenants have very different objectives when they're negotiating a lease and when they're looking to end a lease. But I think the common themes that are coming through from both of those clients are flexibility and security. Now the dilapidations report could be by reference to the schedule of condition which is obviously a more objective standard to measure it against. If in the absence of a schedule of condition, you're looking at the wording of the lease. So what does good and substantial mean in good repair? Most of the time the surveyors will sort of negotiate, but obviously they can go to court because some can have quite significant cost implications. Even something like replacing a carpet, if it's a particular type of carpet, it could cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. And so these are matters that do tend to get litigated. Tenants may decide to do some works before the end of the term to try and save costs. If you have contractors in the premises after the break date and this hasn't been agreed with the landlord, you will be held not to have given up vacant possession because you are still technically in possession of the premises. If works need to be carried out after the end of the term, hand the keys back and then come to some kind of agreement with the landlord afterwards. Be very adaptable to change. There's a balance between needing to plan and business plan and have a certain amount of security, but that plan needs to have elements in it where you can adapt to changing markets. You can't plan for something you don't know about, but having contingencies in place, seeing how you can use the changing market as well to maximise on the opportunities that may present.